All right. So my first question that I have for you is, is how did you get into mushrooms in the first place? It's got to be a, a funny thing to talk to people. Like, what do you do? Well, I study mushrooms. Um, <laughs> how, did, how did that come about? How did that start? And, and what intrigued you to start doing that? Well, well you know, I, I was born and raised in Washington State. Uh, Seattle is where I grew up. And, you know, Washington State, what do we have here? Lots of rain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got beautiful forests and, and we've got probably one of the best areas in the world for wild mushrooms. And so when I grew up, I was able to get out and do some wild mushrooming with uh, parents of friends. And then when I went to university, University of Washington, uh, I studied uh, anthropology but they've got a great mycology department there as well. So I studied mycology at the university and I put the two together into what's termed ethnomycology, which is the use of mushrooms for food, for medicine, and in shamanic purposes. Um, so that was my field of study. And look, as you well know, the 60s was full of shamanism. So that was, you know, we actually had psychoactive mushrooms growing on the campus of the University of Washington. Wow. So, so anyway, it was a real exciting period, interesting period for me. But once, once I got out of university, I mean, what do you do with a degree in anthropology? Well, not a lot of jobs at that time. <laughs> Maybe more today, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I went to my mycology professor. I said, hey, I'd really like to learn how to grow mushrooms. That sounds really interesting. And he said, well, there's a mushroom farm in Olympia, 60 miles down the road. I went down there. I applied for a job. I got a job. And uh, I was there for the next 10 years living with mushrooms. I mean, it was a big farm, 2 million pounds a year. I mean, 200 employees, a big farm, but I was literally living with mushrooms for the next 10 years. Wow. Uh, what, when, when you were down there living there and, and literally living with the mushrooms, um, how many different species of mushrooms, or I would, I would think it would be considered species of mushrooms were you guys growing? And, and also, I guess, like how many different variations of mushrooms are there? Because I believe there's a lot of different mushroom types out there, right? Oh, oh yeah. There, there's tens of thousands of different species. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about is the different species. For example, the mushroom farm that I was working on, primarily what it grew was the agaricus mushroom. And that is the button mushroom that you see in the supermarkets, the very common. And, and uh, the button mushroom, sometimes you'll see it, it's white. Sometimes it'll be brown and they'll call it a cremini. Sometimes you see the really big caps that are open and they'll call those a portobello, all the same species, all agaricus. But here's what was really cool. And I was so fortunate while I was there, we had a Japanese scientist, Dr. Uriyama, and he was our director of research and development. He was growing shiitake, um, oyster mushroom, and uh, enokitake. So I got to see and be a part of those experiments that he was actually doing. And in 1978, uh, the mushroom farm called Oster Mushroom Farm, we introduced the very first uh, fresh shiitake mushrooms into the markets, into the supermarkets in Western Washington, 1978. Uh, and the cool thing was, is I had access, I was... I was eating fresh shiitake in the 70s. And uh, the funny thing was, is that the whole marketing effort, which was very strong, bombed. And what happened is, is people said, oh, shiitake mushroom is just a little bit too strong. And it was just like, and I was just like, are you kidding? Have you ever eaten shiitake mushrooms, Cody? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love shiitake mushrooms. They're my favorite mushroom. Delicious. No, it didn't work. It probably took another 10 or 15 years before shiitake got sort of reintroduced into the markets. Again, mostly on the West Coast, down in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, something like that. But it took a while longer before it really got rolling. From a, from a history perspective, I, I have a couple questions. One follow-up question was, you mentioned there's tens of thousands of species, and then you named multiple types just in one species. So if we consider just like 
all the types of mushrooms, would you say there's literally millions of different types of mushrooms? And are they still well, discovering them? Well, no, not really. There, there's, I, I mean, remember a couple things here. One of which is we're talking about the um, <clears throat> a kingdom of fungi. Mm. And, and there's the kingdom of animals, the kingdom of plants, kingdom of fungi. There's a lot of fungi that do not produce mushrooms. So there's millions of species, different species of these, these fungi, but only, let's say, 100,000 or so that will actually produce a mushroom. And the other thing is that although a lot of those species are edible, and there's some that are poisonous, but a lot of them are edible. But the thing is, is that just because they're edible does not mean that they taste good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a lot of edible mushrooms out there that you'd go out and you'd hunt for a while and you'd go, oh, wow, this is great. And it's, oh, yeah, it's an edible mushroom. But it's like, yeah, it tastes like um, leaves or it tastes like dirt or it tastes yeah. like something that is not what you want to be eating. There's, there's maybe two dozen what we could call edible and choice mushrooms that people will find wild and probably 12 to 15 species that are cultivated and this is the other thing is that is that only certain mushrooms can be cultivated and normally those mushrooms are are mushrooms that that let, let's for example say for example they grow on wood great they grow on wood so we can we can inoculate the mushroom spawn into a log and grow those mushrooms or into sawdust and grow those mushrooms. So we figured out how to grow again about two dozen different species. But beyond that, uh, it's not easy because for one, a lot of mushrooms need a live tree to actually produce chaga, for example. Um, you know, you've heard of chaga probably, yep. right? Yep. Chaga is actually um, it grows on a tree, it grows on a, a, a birch tree, but it's a tree pathogen. And it's not even a mushroom. It, have you ever seen what, seen a chaga? I've only had it in tea, so I don't well, know. Well, okay, a chaga is, is like this gnarly, blackened growth that comes off the side of a tree. You'd look at it and you'd go, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> even when you see it, you know, after it's been harvested and chunked out or stuff it's like what you know so so um <clears throat> the there's definitely only a certain number of species that have been brought into cultivation that um and only a certain number of species that we look for as wild mushroom hunters in all of those thousands of species that are out there so the actual ones that we eat and know and hunt for are small compared to the vast number that we have do, do we know why people even really started embarking down this this path in the first place? I mean, obviously, like in ancient times, I'm sure there was people eating them for psychedelic purposes because they ate something and they discovered, hey, this sends me on a spiritual journey, and that's great. Um, but at what point did people really start <clears throat> studying this and, and trying to find different mushrooms that did different things for different purposes? Well, you know – the Chinese are really the ones that, that and, and other Asians like the Japanese, the ones that really got into this because mushrooms have been used in traditional Chinese medicine for thousands of years. And so they kind of figured it out. And, and you know, it, it's interesting, like any food, when you think about it, well, of course, humans have been munching on everything you can imagine, especially in times of, of famine, let's say. I mean, I mean, one of the things about China that always blows my mind is that, is there anything that they don't eat in China? <laughs> you know, you know, friends of mine in China uh, will tell me the, the joke there is um, the Chinese will eat anything on four legs except a table and, and anything that flies except an airplane. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's like there are my friends over there that are telling me these stories and that, that's just funny to me but I mean think about it if there's a famine going on in a country and you have a large population you are eating everything and, and before that too just as a human species we're we're testing a lot of things and and there's probably a lot of people that end up with um, upset stomachs and all the rest from eating the wrong things over time but we sort of figure it out it's pretty amazing actually but let's face it we've had like 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to kind of get it all sorted out and know what's good and what's not. And so mushrooms have been a part of that. In, in the 1700s, this is one of the cool things about mushrooms, in England, they called mushrooms poor man's meat. Well, you know, think about it for a second. They're out there in the commons. You can go out and you can collect them mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. And some of them are big and meaty. That's poor man's meat. Yeah. And you go, wow, that's kind of cool, <laughs> right? And even today, you can, in some places, you can get a uh, mushroom burger. A yeah. And sometimes that burger will actually be like a huge portobello or something, uh, or, or sometimes it will be mushrooms chopped up and blended with ground round or something like that. In fact, more and more products are starting to, to blend their, their uh, ground round with mushrooms. And they've done a lot of tests that show that, that actually even up to 50% mushroom, people find them very, very tasty. And I've seen that a lot in coffee lately like that's been a big thing with like chaga and lion's mane and people grinding it up into coffee and everything and that's actually what first introduced me to the even this topic at all was somebody was like oh you got to try this lion's mane coffee and i was like oh yeah what is lion's mane <laughs> went down that rabbit hole but yeah um, yeah yeah I'd, I'd love to i'd love to dive into um i mean a few things i've I kind of like a list of things i want to ask you but sure um one being the the t I really want listeners to be able to take away from this like what mushrooms they should be looking into consuming and why and we can go on different paths I know there's some that are just from a nutrition standpoint they're just beneficial um, there's ones that are more medicinal and there's ones that I call them spiritual but this is where we kind of go down a trip sure um, sure if we can kind of like go through the categories and, and explain which ones they are, why they are the way they are, what the benefits are, so on and so forth. That would be amazing. Yeah, well, certain, well let me just start off first and, and go, okay, let's talk about nutritional value. When I was at the mushroom farm in 1973, classical nutritionists looked at mushrooms and they said, no food value, simply something that tastes good, maybe you put it in with something. The reason they said that is mushrooms are low in calories. So it's not like that type of food where you're going to have a lot of carbs that will give you this burst of energy or anything. Mushrooms are, are uh, 20 to 40% protein, a good profile of amino acids, essential amino acids, maybe only one of the essential amino acids that are missing. They are primarily carbohydrate, but very high quality carbohydrates. Mushrooms do not have starch, no starch in a mushroom, they're not like a grain that you're gonna, you know, eat flour, bread or something like that and you get that burst of, uh, you know, high glycemic index type of sugar. Um, mushrooms, carbohydrates in mushrooms are mannitol, which is a very slow acting carb. Also carbohydrates called beta-glucans, which are polysaccharides. Beta-glucans, we'll talk more about those because they are what give mushrooms their medicinal properties. Every mushroom has got them, but certain mushrooms have a little bit different architecture of the beta-glucans that make them more medicinal than the others. Mushrooms are high in fiber. So they're considered a prebiotic. So they're going to be feeding your microbiome. They're, they're uh, high in B, vitamins B1, 2, and 3. You can get up to 25% of your RDA of, of B3 through mushrooms. Uh, Mineral-wise, potassium, phosphorus. Um, they have a precursor in them to vitamin D2 that if you put your mushrooms out in, out in the sun or if they've been sun-dried, you'll get a reasonable amount of vitamin D out of them. So all in all, I always recommend to people, look, put mushrooms into your diet. They're just a really good food. In fact, I consider them the um, missing link or the forgotten food. So A, start with mushrooms as, um, as a food that you can, you know, really, you can use it in so many ways. It's just, it's just so versatile to use, whether it be, you know, throw it into your omelet, um, use it with your, if you're a meat eater, uh, put it with any of the meats that you're doing, put it in the stir fries, you name it. Now, certain mushrooms have medicinal properties and the primary medicinal properties of mushrooms is 
they will um, activate or, or let's just say they will potentiate your immune system. You know, right now, I mean, how many people out there are wanting something that can potentiate their immunity, right? I mean, mushrooms, have, that, is, that is where the beta-glucans come in. So uh, mushroom beta-glucans, what happens is that as we are uh, consuming the mushrooms or even taking a mushroom supplement, those beta-glucans will hit certain receptor sites that we have in our lower intestines. We have, we have receptor sites that are specific to beta-glucans. And when, when it hits those receptor sites, then that will stimulate the production of macrophages, uh, T cells, uh, NK cells. Uh, and, and the cool thing about mushrooms is that they, they act in the background. They, they are there. The, if, if you need that kind of immunological activation, they'll do it. If you don't, they'll just kind of hang out there in the background. So it's really, it's really interesting. And, and that's where you really have to be consuming them in a, in a regular way so that they're there. Um, and, and they're not like taking a ibuprofen or an aspirin or something like that. They don't like, like tomorrow you go, oh my God, that mushroom is <laughs> fabulous. Right. You know, that's not how they act. I've seen anecdotal stuff for people who say that. And all I can say is either you're much more sensitive than I am <laughs> or, or there's the placebo uh, act, you know, the activity uh, manifesting. But at any rate, it's just a great food. Uh, it's a great supplement. And, and we, can, we can start in any number of places in terms of the specific mushrooms and what they do. And the whole idea of the mushroom coffee man, where did that come from anyway? You know, it's kind yeah. of like, like mushroom coffee. Wow. I mean, I like coffee. Do you drink coffee? I drink a lot of coffee. Me too. I think that's the, the number one nootropic out there, right? It's like, yeah, yeah that, that's something like the first thing I do in the morning when I get up is I put the water on. Let's get moving here, right? So the fact that mushrooms get put in coffee it's interesting, and I actually put reishi mushroom in my coffee, and the reason I do is that reishi mushroom is bitter. Have you ever tasted reishi? I've had reishi coffee, so I've had coffee with reishi, and you can definitely, it's a, it's a distinct taste compared to regular coffee. Okay, and was it like a, a uh, something where you had other things blended in with it, or was it just reishi mushroom with you know, added to just ground coffee or something like that. Yeah, it was just reishi mushroom added to ground coffee. Okay, because, because you know, we sell to, God, I don't know, dozens of companies who put out reishi coffees. Um, and, and probably they use our other mushrooms for other type of coffees. Think about, uh, for me, I drink my coffee black. I don't sweeten it or anything. So I, I like the flavor of coffee. I, I like a dark roast. Reishi's bitter. I put that in there and it just gives another bitter tone or another bitter note to my coffee. So for me, it tastes good. A lot of people would go, oh man, you know, that reishi is too bitter. I, I you know, what can I do with it? They'll take it in a capsule or something like that. Reishi is called in China, the mushroom of immortality. Wow. Yeah, it sounds appealing. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound appealing, but, but maybe the real mushroom of immortality is something else, but we can get to that later. But, but reishi is called the mushroom of immortality. It's got a high percentage. In fact, one of the highest percentages of these beta glucans. And it has compounds called triterpenoids and triterpenoids are what give reishi its bitter flavor. So reishi has um, not just the beta-glucans, which is shared with a lot of the other mushrooms, but also these triterpenoids that are very, very good for the liver. And, and you know, the liver is such an important organ that anything that can help the liver process all of those different impurities and so on that we've got is, is a good thing. So, so that's used a lot for... Um, especially as people get older, that's, that's what they would say. Just, just put reishi into your diet and start using it for just as a general tonic. 
Uh, um, so reishi is really, I always tell people, look, at, if you're going to use one mushroom as a supplement, use reishi. So, so that's definitely one that I, I highly recommend to people. Uh, the one you talked about earlier in your coffee was lion's mane, right? Mm-hmm. Lion's Mane, what a cool name, huh? Yeah, yeah. that's what got me in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. If you've ever seen one out in nature, it the reason they call it the Lion's Mane is it's a big kind of white round thing. Then it's got a lot of kind of short spines that hang off of it, sometimes longer. So it looks kind of like a mane. But in China, they actually call it monkey head. <laughs> so lion's mane is kind of what we call it in the west but but lion's mane is interesting because it stimulates what is called what is a, a called nerve growth factor a nerve growth factor is an amino acid that we we all produce and it stimulates and and organizes our neurons and, and in in tests in actual clinical trials in japan they've demonstrated that that helps people with memory issues and even helps people with um, early onset dementia and how they do this is they actually will um, take a control group of like 30 older people and 30 older people that that they give lion's mane three grams a day which is not a whole lot three dried grams a day of just the, the lion's mane powder they give them a battery of tests. After 120 days, they test them again, and the people taking the lion's mane do better. Well, you know, for what it's worth, I mean, and then the interesting part about that particular study was that after they stopped taking it and they tested them 30 days later after the, the group stopped taking lion's mane, they dropped down to baseline. And that I thought was really the interesting part about the study because it was sort of like, okay, in order to maintain these benefits, you have to kind of, it's not like they're, they're um, changing something in us that changes and all of a sudden, okay, yeah, we don't have to take it anymore. It's all good. No, it's kind of like, okay, you have to take this to maintain those benefits. So, so um, lion's mane has gotten this reputation of enhancing memory, uh, focus as kind of a, a premier, nootropic mm -hmm. and and it's funny uh cody because five years ago i sold our company sold cl close to no lion's mane <laughs> close to none i mean today we sell lion's mane by the ton <laughs> i'm not kidding you it's the number one mushroom product that we sell is lion's mane i believe it and it's just it's just craziness um the other one that came out of nowhere was uh chaga yep that's what i was gonna ask about next yeah and and chaga you know traditionally has been used for stomach issues um it's traditionally been used as a folk remedy for cancer uh, and, and first of all let me just say i don't i don't advocate using any of the mushrooms for cancer anything we don't make any claims that way you know some some of these things have been used as folk remedies which is fine but but a lot of times uh, and what has happened is certain of these mushrooms have been refined into um, quasi pharmaceuticals for use in japan and china as adjunct to actual uh, when people are going through chemo or radiation or something like that, they will give them these in, a, in uh, order to help their immune system cope with being torn down by these, by chemotherapy or something. But um, chaga, so chaga has been used that way. And, and one of the things um, I, I want to say right now is, look, if you go out on the internet, it's like there are so many sites claiming chaga does anything and everything that you can imagine 
you know what I mean? You've seen those sites before, yeah. whether it be Chaga or other things. And they, they claim it's a panacea and, and they've got some amazing story behind it and all of this. And, and I just say to people, look, calm down. It's not the king of mushrooms, which is also what they claim. King of mushrooms. Cody, in my lifetime, I have met four kings of mushrooms. So, so kings come and go. And, yeah. and today, Chaga is kind of like the new king. And I just look at that as, as too much marketing speak and hyperbole. And Chaga is a good medicinal mushroom, but let's keep it all in perspective. I, I've... I mean, the, the lion's mane, I think it, it makes sense why it's the most po- one of the most popular because nootropics kind of hit the scene in, in this like era of entrepreneurship and productivity and everything like that. And it's attractive. I mean, I, I take nootropics every single day. I actually yeah. have one that has lion's mane in it. Um, yeah. And then there was the coffees and stuff. And I know there's one and you, ca- and you just talked about reishi and chaga. So uh, apologies if you already kind of said this, but I believe one of them, the way I was kind of, the way I saw it was like lion's manes in the morning when I need to be productive. And then I can't remember if it was Chaga or Reishi was more like at night to calm me down. And it was like more of like a stress reduction, anxiety, stuff like that. Um, is there any truth to that or is that more? No, no, that, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Reishi. Reishi okay. is actually something where they've done studies uh, with insomniacs, uh, they consider reishi something that will help you deal with stress, calm you down. That's why they're talking about reishi in the evening, even though I take mine in the morning. Um, and, and uh, hey, I'm not a calm guy, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> well, not with all that coffee in, in me, that's for yeah, sure. No, no <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, and, and that's where, you know, reishi is considered an adaptogen. And, and adaptogen, uh, you've probably heard that term. Yep. And, and, and that's kind of um, a lot of, it's kind of dealing with something that's non-specific, but also something that, that promotes harmony and balance. And, you know, my philosophy is that a lot of illness comes from just being out of balance. And, and what's one of the, the best ways to get out of balance? The food you eat. Oh my God. I mean, you're obviously aware of the different food out there that is in those center aisles of the supermarkets and and all of the processing and chemicals and things we don't really need. And, And so anything that can help us stay in balance uh, and and bring us more of a homeostasis, which is kind of what we're looking for, because illness is just kind of like okay, rather than than having this homeostasis, now we're we've got this illness, and so all of a sudden this uh, this balance we've just gone completely out of balance, and so that's what we're we're really looking for, and that's where diet is like the foundation to all that diet as well as as you well know um exercising staying active for goodness sakes god i mean in today's world think how much time we spend in either a chair or if we're not in that chair maybe we're in a vehicle yeah (laughs) in another chair and it's just insane when you think of the fact that as humans, there was a time when we mostly were out there walking around, or maybe we were on horseback or something like that. But now so many people are so sedentary yeah. <clears throat> that, that you can get out of balance very quickly. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's part of the reason why posture is so bad. We talk about this all the time, right? Like people, you wake up, you sit down, eat breakfast and you get in your car and you drive to work and you sit down at your desk and then you drive to the gym and you get on a bike and you go on a group <laughs> fitness class on a bike and you're kind of on it constantly in this flexed position, right? Yeah. Standing tall and extending. So you we, know what? We talk about that one a lot. You know what? And I, I totally agree with that posture, man alive. And it's even the chairs that we sit in. I mean, I actually have a thousand dollar chair that is designed for 
a good <laughs> posture. I'm kind of I'm kind of laying down in it right now, but <laughs> but it is. And I think about my posture all the time. And you know, it's kind of funny because when when I was growing up, my mother used to keep saying, "Jeff." stand up straight yeah <laughs> and, and and you know i'm kind of like yeah yeah blah, blah, whatever but but it's so true i mean i mean not only standing up straight but it opens up your chest cavity to where you're breathing deeper and instead of kind of that shallow breathing where you're never getting in the kind of oxygen you need no it's absolutely a critical part of being healthy yeah yeah um I, I want to ask with, with the medicinal side of mushrooms is the ones we just talked about, lion's mane, reishi, chaga, are those considered medicinal? And whether they are or not, what other medicinal mushrooms should we be looking out for, if any? Well, um, yes, th those are, are medicinal. The thing about reishi and chaga is they're not mushrooms that we're going to fry up and eat in a meal because mm -hmm. they, reishi is hard as wood. Uh, chaga is, is just like rock hard so those i mean in terms of food wise it would be in a tea or something like that but but medicinal mushrooms that we can eat would be definitely lion's mane delicious um you might be able to find it in um in a in a, a pcc or maybe in a whole foods you might be lucky enough to have lion's mane sold there but the other uh, mushrooms that are medicinal and also can be used as food would be uh, shiitake and my talkie, definitely, and and we talked a little bit about shiitake, but shiitake is is something that, it, in in a way, um, shiitake and reishi were kind of like the first of the mushrooms that we all of a sudden recognized as having these medicinal properties. Shiitake, they developed a a pure beta glucan and turned it into a drug in Japan. Shiitake is a fabulous medicinal mushroom. And, that, and that's why I always say to people, make that your primary mushroom that you eat because you'll be getting those beta glucans that will, uh, so, so, you know, that, that's one of the things where I really like, which is food as medicine. You know, food is medicine in the sense of that if it feeds us the right nutrients, that's what we're looking for. But if it also has these other properties that which can actually enhance our immunity, and you know that, that's the thing about the mushrooms is they're they're uh, um, antibacterial, they're antifungal, they're antiviral. I mean, mushrooms have all of these different capabilities and benefits for us that that um, putting them into our diet is just. A no-brainer, really, and that—that's where everybody should be eating mushrooms. And then, two, in terms of supplementing, okay, yeah, we've got about half a dozen, eight or ten different mushrooms. And and the way the way I look at it is, what we do is we we'll look at traditional Chinese medicine. What mushrooms are they using, and what are they using them for? Um, shiitake and maitake primarily have been used for immunological benefits. Again, with the beta glucans. Turkey tail. Have you heard of turkey tail? I have not. Turkey tail is another uh, mushroom that is a, uh, what we call a polypore, which is the same as reishi. Whereas, you know, a normal mushroom, we turn it over and it's got gills. Um, but a polypore, we turn it over and it's uh, uh, all sorts of microscopic pores on the underside. Um, a lot of the polypores are what will grow off the side of a tree what we might consider a bracket fungus or something like that. And they're in general, very woody, not edible. Turkey tail is like that, but it's a very high quality medicinal mushroom that you could look for as a supplement. And one of the interesting things that we've done is we test every single batch that we produce for beta glucans. In fact, this test is something that has allowed us to, to really build a profile uh, of the mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms. So we will, we will test for beta glucans. We will test for alpha glucans, which are starches or what's cool about mushrooms. Mushrooms don't produ produce starch, but they produce glycogen. Well, glycogen is the human storage carbohydrate. 
that's something that we share in common with fungi. So we'll test for these alpha glucans. We'll also test for ergosterol. Ergosterol is what I was telling you is a precursor to vitamin D. Um, so actually, one of the things that, that we even sell is we, we sell a vitamin D product from mushrooms. So, so what we do is we expose mushroom powder to UV light, and that turns this ergosterol into vitamin D2. It's an amazing thing. And, you know, you've probably heard nothing but information about vitamin D in these last couple months, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 And, and I've been reading about vitamin D for, for years now, and especially since uh, in, a, in a mushroom, we've got this precursor to vitamin D where you can, you can turn that into, into vitamin D. You know, the vitamin D3 that is out there that, that is most of the vitamin D that, gets, that we consume comes from lanolin, which is from sheep's wool, and then it gets processed and they pull out the vitamin D3 of it from it. Um, we, we create vitamin D3 through cholesterol. So when we expose our skin to UV light, which is sun, then that cholesterol that's on in the surface turns into vitamin D3. And, and that's how we get our vitamin D, unless we supplement. Um, because there's, there's very few foods that have reasonable amounts of vitamin D. So, so vitamin D is really one of those amazing, um, I guess you'd say amazing properties to mushrooms that we can actually tap into. The other thing we test for is a compound called ergothionine, which is a very strong antioxidant. So we've got a profile of the supplements that we sell and, and we test every single lot and one of the things that we should talk about here, because it's really important for your listeners, and that is the quality of the mushroom supplements that are in the marketplace. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, supplements, be careful, because there's a lot of, a lot of lousy, low-quality supplements. Absolutely true. And it's, it's definitely part of what you would call the medicinal mushroom category. And here's why. You know, um, you know, mushrooms, how do you grow a mushroom? Uh, mushrooms don't have seeds. <laughs> so what do you do? You can't plant, you, where are the seeds? How do I do this? Well, mushrooms produce spores. So these spores go out in nature and, and mushrooms produce, a single mushroom produces billions of spores. They, they land on the ground, they land on wood. Uh, at some point when conditions are right, that spore will germinate into a very, very fine filament. And when multiple filaments fuse together, they'll form a network and that network is called mycelium. You've probably heard of mycelium, right? I actually haven't until I started reading up on your stuff. So I would love if you could kind of break down the difference. Between sure, the sure. And the well, the mycelium is the actual body of this fungus. So, uh, um, and what it does is it is what is, is consuming all of the organic matter out there. You know, think about it. Every year we've got all these leaves, all of these annual plants that are dying, all of this wood, uh, leaves, you name it, that is falling to the ground. And it's got to be decomposed or else we would be swimming in this stuff. So, so uh, this fungal mycelium is consuming all of that and ultimately repurposing that into humus. I mean, it does that with, with uh, uh, help from bacteria and uh, yeasts and bugs and all sorts of other things. But it's very important to our ecosystem and repurposing all that organic matter into something useful for plant growth. Now, when conditions are right, and you know, here in, here in um, Washington State or British Columbia, that means the fall, like right now. Well, temperature drops, rains a lot, which means humidity goes up. Now that mycelium stops growing and puts up a mushroom. 
So um, that mycelium, as it's been breaking everything down, it's been building up its energy stores. And when the conditions right, up comes the mushroom and the mushroom goes through its development. Uh, the gills uh, are exposed and then it produces spores. And now we have a, a basic um, um, life cycle of this organism. So, you know, when we're looking at a supplement, you're looking at, okay, what is the plant part of that supplement? You know, when, when we're looking at ginseng, we want a root. Uh, other supplements, it might be the fruit or the flower, or like with ginkgo, it's the leaf where the, the main medicinal compounds reside. So the plant part is very important. Now, one of the things about mushrooms is, did, did you know that every single mushroom is, is uh, um, picked by hand? Oh, I did not. I would not assume that knowing there's so many. <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah. And, and have you ever been on a, have you ever been on a mushroom farm? I haven't. I think there, you know, what's funny is I, I think there, I talked to somebody uh, who, who isn't into the field as much as you are, but they're interested in the field. And they said that there was one in Olympia that I should go visit. Uh, that's the farm that I worked on for 10 years. Yeah. That's what I figured when you said that earlier. Yeah. Ostrom's and, and, you know, we had an army of people to harvest the mushrooms because one of the things about mushroom growing is you have at any one time, you might have, uh, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 crops that are in different stages and it's all on a 90 day cycle and you have to pick those mushrooms every single day you've got to be in there harvesting them because they're in all different stages of growth and when they're mature you've got to be right there to harvest them get them into a cooler and then get them out to the marketplace it's a very short window so growing mushrooms is actually very expensive so uh, as an example, when you um, take your mushrooms into the local markets, that the agaricus mushroom, maybe you're getting $5 a pound uh, for that at retail or something like the farmer's only getting maybe $2 or something like that. Well, supplements are dried powders. So if I'm selling that mushroom out there for $5 a pound and I dry it out, well, a mushroom like a vegetable is 90% water. Now, all of a sudden, instead of $5, I got to get $50 for that same pound of mushroom. Mm. The economics do not work for supplements. So there is no, no mushrooms are grown in the United States and turned into the supplement market. They're just not. So where do they come from? What's going on here? Well, we grow all of the, our mushrooms actually in China, and I've been growing them there since the 90s. And the reason is they can do it very economically over there. So wh what does that mean for people uh, creating these supplements in the United States? Well, what a lot of people will do, and a lot of companies do, is they take that mycelium, they'll grow it on sterilized grain, at the end of the process, they will dry it, grind it to a powder, grain and all. So a lot of mushroom supplements on the market, including the most popular ones, are mostly starch. Now, is that what you want to be taking? <laughs> Do you want to be taking just starch? And can you imagine a lot, of, a lot of naturopaths are prescribing these particular supplements with all this starch for people with cancer and things like that. Yeah. It's insane. Well, our testing for beta-glucans has, not only does that test tell us how much beta-glucan is in a product, but also tells us how much alpha-glucan, starches or alpha-glucan. What we found when we did tests of all of these products out on the market. And I, I, uh, we bought 40 different products that were manufactured in that way. We tested them all. And what it turns out is that a mushroom has 25 to 60% beta glucan. It has a couple percentage of alpha glucan, which is the glycogen. These products where the mycelium is being grown on the grain were about five or six percent beta glucan 
and 30 to 60% alpha glucan, which is the starch. So they were just the opposite of what you were expecting to get in, in a mushroom product. So, so very low in beta glucan uh, and very high in starch. So, so most of what you're getting is grain powder in these products. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you, how do you know if you're, if you're getting that product? Well, on the front of that label, it says reishi mushroom with a picture of a reishi mushroom. And you're like, well, it said mushroom. Well, turn it over and see what the supplements facts panel says. If it says mycelium, that's probably what you've got, one of these myceliated grain products. And if you look in the other ingredients, which is the fine print, it will oftentimes talk about myceliated rice, myceliated oats, something like that. Those are, are both real tells to let you know that's what you are buying. And it's really unfortunate. For example, if you were to take one of those products and it's a reishi product, pour out the what's in the capsule, taste it, it would not taste bitter at all. It would taste kind of, kind of sweet like grain. So you have to be very careful when you're buying your supplements to make sure that they say 100% mushroom, uh, talk about beta glucans, because these companies will never talk about beta glucans because they don't have any. And, and if it says made in the USA, most likely that's what you're getting. Uh, so th that's what's very important when you are actually looking for a high quality supplement because at least 50% of the products that call themselves mushrooms, that's what they are. Got it. I would, that's one of the questions I really wanted to ask to make sure people can leave this and know what to get. Um, so you're saying it should probably not be made in the United States. That's right. And, okay. and you know, it's kind of, counterintuitive right because right now everybody's kind of like you know i want to i want to do some eat locally yeah. i want something made in the usa i get that I, i'm really into local products and purchasing local products and i totally support that but you know I, i'm a mushroom grower by trade i spent 10 years on a very large commercial farm i know the economics of it so i figured that out very early that if i wanted to actually get into selling mushrooms as supplements. And, and I started my company in 1989. <laughs> Cody, there wasn't a single mushroom supplement in the market at that time. I had to literally educate people and, and tell them what it was about mushrooms that why they should put it into their line of all of these other green herbs because nobody knew a thing about mushrooms. It took the whole 10 years of the 90s to actually build the business to where actually selling product and people were putting out mushroom products. So, yeah. so you know, I know the economics of it. And, and look, people go, oh yeah, China, nah, not going to do it, right? Look, there are a lot of chemicals sprayed in the United States on everything on so much of the food and and you know yeah. do you want to eat something that's grown in the land of the gulf coast of the united states no of course not you know so that's and i so i understand all that but we grow our mushrooms way back in the mountains of china far away from the big industrial centers plus we analyze everything for heavy metals, for pesticides. Our, our products are organically certified. They get, uh, go through the analysis before they leave China. And then once they uh, arrive over here to our warehouse, we test them again a second time. We can't sell our products unless they meet the standards. Mm -hmm. and, and so the only way you're ever going to get a genuine mushroom product, it's going to have to come from somewhere else. It's not going to come from united states got it and and are you your company is is selling directly to the consumer or are you selling to these companies that are making these supplement coffee tea mushroom products both okay both, uh do yeah. you have like uh a one drop obviously like your website where we can order stuff like that but then also any like supporting brands that you say like these people are doing well. Um, I've had a couple in my head that I wanted to shout out, but I don't want 
to put somebody on blast if they're not a great company. Um, so I'd love for you to just drop a couple names, including your own company. Yeah, well, well um, and first of all, yeah, I, I, I would never, you know, sort of discuss brands or say, oh, this brand is better, that brand. We can talk about that after we're off. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I like to do that with people, especially if they they're taking a supplement to find out what supplement they are taking. Then I can give you some info on that supplement. Um, you know, um, our my, my company, of course, is Namex.com. We're a raw material supplier to other companies, and I, I could give you a couple of brands. Um, you know, for example, um, Solgar. Uh, Wakanaga. Most of the other companies, newer companies would be like, oh, don't reveal that you're selling to us because we don't want other companies to know that because then they'll want to buy from you and then we'll have more competitors. And so I normally won't mention too many other companies. I know with uh, Solgar and Wakanaga, they, they're fine with that. They don't really, you know, have those kind of issues. Um, and, and then we also sell direct to consumer with a brand called Real Mushrooms. And then you can buy it off the website, realmushrooms.com. We don't sell in the stores or anything like mm -hmm. that, just, just online. Um, but, but, you know, th th this, is, this is really important because a lot of people are buying what they think is a mushroom product when, in fact, it's, it's mostly um, grain starch. Do you know what tempeh is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you know how they make tempeh? I don't. Tempeh is cooked soybeans with uh, fungal mycelium grown on it. So if you've ever if you've ever eaten tempeh, you've eaten mycelium. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's really kind of a cool process. But and that's what these people are doing. But they're selling it as mushroom mm. <laughs> and it's not it's basically tempeh that they're grind drying grinding uh and selling it as a mushroom it's not a mushroom mycelium is a very is a very simple uh part of this mushroom organism the mushroom itself is actually very complex produces all of these interesting compounds for example <clears throat> when people are out there are looking for a psychoactive mushroom, are they eating that, the mycelium that's been grown on grain? No, <laughs> not quite, <laughs> because it's not producing the compounds they want. Right. You know, it's, no, it's like the mushroom that is like this amazing biofactory producing all of these compounds so that what they want they want the mushroom of course that's what they want yeah um which i'd love to get into real quick before i let you go but uh, i do want to just kind of recap a couple things before we move into that area sure. of expertise sure. um sure. i'll have you uh send me some links to your website the real mushroom.com all that stuff so i can link all the the verified mushroom companies in the show notes of this podcast. So if you're listening and want to get something, you can go to the right place. Cool. Um, but I think it's, it's been really cool to hear just how important they are. Cause I think a lot of people from I've, I've had the conversation with, uh, I can think of a couple friends, my sister-in-law, the guy that works with me that were like, ew, mushrooms. No. And in, in, so the way we, always cook them in my family's we do big barbecues and we'll do bubbling chicken so we'll take like a big foil casserole like dish and we make homemade mcbroom barbecue sauce and we boil the chicken on a barbecue in that but we put a ton of mushrooms in it and before we eat the chicken we go out to the barbecue with a toothpick and we sit there and eat all the mushrooms out of it and awesome. every person that tells me they don't like mushrooms that's how i get them to start eating mushrooms and that is so that good. is so awesome yeah man. so it's that really good. really cool yeah and, any anytime i make a stew or something i'm i'm cutting up and throwing all the mushrooms yeah. into the broth it's yeah. like absolutely yeah we do it with so many different things too at my household but um but it's good because i think that like you said like there's you know there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are either nutritionists dietitians trainers coaches and then everybody else is they're looking to be leaner be more muscular perform better in their their fitness endeavor be healthier um and it's cool that like mushrooms are extremely low calorie so they're great to fit into a diet plan but they're packed with vitamins packed with minerals um, and they obviously have a lot of medicinal purposes as well. So I think it's, it's cool for people to hear this and know that like, okay, I can put these in my food for the vitamins and minerals and benefits of health. And I can drink this in the morning for 
focus and in, in memory and I can drink this at night to help me calm down and go to sleep. And, um, it's just a really cool thing. And I think people should all have it in their routine. So I'm glad we did this and I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to put some links in the show notes for people to click and go get good products. So they're not just buying whatever they see marketed on Facebook, which is usually what happens first. Oh um, yeah. But I do want to ask just before we go, <clears> like, <throat> If you have any um, expertise, I got to imagine you've looked into it a little bit because you're in this field, but um, the psychedelic mushrooms and, you know, when I was growing up, um, they were more looked at. It's just purely like you just want to go trip out. Like it's just just for party purposes, right? You just go trip out. And as I got older and I got more into entrepreneurship and I started talking to more people, I found more and more people using it to, for personal development and going through these spiritual journeys and growing as an individual. Um, and it kind of throws a big curveball into the whole like drug conversation. Um, but I'm curious, uh, obviously if you, if you're, this isn't something you, you discuss or know much about, we don't have to, but if you do know anything, I'd just love to hear about, um, your opinions on, on that whole entire region of mushrooms. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, look, that, that was something that, that I studied in the university, besides the fact that we were taking a lot of that for in different ways. Um, there's a number of things that are, that are really important when you're, when you're actually consuming a philosophy mushroom, especially if you want to do it in a way for, for like um, self-improvement or development of the spiritual side and, and just development of yourself in general. And that would be, um, and you, you maybe have heard of this before, it's called set and setting. Set means do not do it if you're preoccupied with other things that uh, just you can't get out of your mind. You want to be you want to be in a place where you're you're kind of you're you're reasonably happy. There's not any real uh, distractions going on or conflicts that are going on. No, you want to be in a fairly good mindset, and then you want to do it in a in a place where um, you feel safe. You've got somebody there that is going to deal with anything that comes up like, okay, there's someone at the door or, you know, unplug your phone, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And, and this is this classic, the way that they've used it traditionally, like the, the people in Mexico, the curanderas uh, that are down there using it, and, and they're always doing it at night because at night, the whole idea is to block out other stimulus right take it in a space where you're in a comfortable room you're you're maybe even lying down or sitting back it's really maybe you have a candle or two going if you want if you've got some special music you like sure that too but just lay back and close your eyes and just let it come on and and there's um, a number of things will be happening. One, one of which is you'll start to feel it come on and you'll be kind of like, oh, okay, wow, you know, and, and you might get a little bit anxious, but just kind of like, okay, it's all going to be good. No problem here. And then it'll come on. And ultimately, the feeling of mushrooms is very ecstatic. I mean, you're going to feel really good. Like, oh my God. God, you know, if you get to a certain point, it'll be like, it'll be like an orgasm, really, that kind of ecstasy that you could ultimately reach. But also, as you close your eyes, you'll have all sorts of very interesting visions and, and colors and geometric forms and things like this. And the, the whole key is to stay calm, uh, uh, try not to uh, um, get too uh, involved in trying to figure out what this, just let your mind drift away and just give yourself over to it. And, and again, the key here is being in a safe space uh, away from, you know, you're not on a busy street and there's all this traffic noise or you're not somewhere where people are going to be busting in and, Hey, what's going on or anything like that? No, do it. You know, this is, this is where, where like in, uh, for example, the native American church in, in the United States, I mean, they'll do it. People will come together when they come together in a group and they'll have a, a fire in the middle. It'll be like in a teepee and people will be around that and they'll take it and everybody's very calm and, and there'll be somebody at the door. So nobody else comes in, somebody tending the fire, but otherwise, the people who are consuming the peyote in this sense, they're there, they're, they feel safe with the other people. And then people will sing songs and, and uh, have this experience in a joint way. Um, but taking it with 
with friends at times is, is really a good way to do it and, and have somebody there that will deal with all of the externalities that may show up or not. But at least you know that you're in a safe place. You're not going to have thing, unexpected things happening. You're just going to be able to focus on the experience itself. So, and in, in you mentioned peyote. Uh, I know there's <laughs> ayahuasca as well, and then there's DMT. Yep. Those are kind of the three that I hear tossed around a lot. Um, yep. I'm assuming peyote is a, a mushroom based on what you just said. Is ayahuasca is a plant or is that a mushroom? Actually, well? actually peyote is a cactus. Oh, a cactus. Okay. And ayahuasca is a vine and a second plant that they, they brew together to uh, get the actual ayahuasca itself. And, and is that other plant? <laughs> is that DMT? Well, it, the ayahuasca is a, a form of DMT. Ah, yes. okay, okay. Yeah, Got absolutely. It. And and it's in that's in the same basic family tryptamines of the psilocybin that is, is in the mushroom. And, and right now, you hear a lot more about ayahuasca. And I think the key with ayahuasca is that is that you know at this point in time. There's a lot of people that have been to South America. There's still shamans down there. And so people want to do it with a shaman uh, because, you know, I mean, the thing about it is, is when you're first doing it, having somebody there that can help you with the experience is relatively important. The number of, of those kind of people in North America, I mean, they, they don't, they're not in the phone book, right? So it's like, where do you find these people? But you don't necessarily even need those people the key thing is, but it's nice to have somebody who's had the experience before right. and they know what's going on and they can help people out if they get anxious in any way. The key, the key with them really is, is to don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious about it. Know that you're safe. Just be able to kick back. That's not always easy because sometimes it's a very powerful experience. I mean, if you take a, a certain amount, it's a very powerful experience. So it's not always easy to be calm. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you open your eyes and you're like, oh my God, look at the colors, look at this and that. And you know, it's very, very unusual and let's just call it non-ordinary reality. Yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned psilocybin and something popped in my head is, as I've heard about people micro dosing psilocybin. Um, and from the way I've seen it or heard about it, it's, it's almost like they're taking such a small amount that they don't go to that extent of this journey. Let's say they, instead it's, it's a very, very subtle amount, almost like a nootropic. Is that, would that be correct? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. And, and they would be taking maybe, you know, if it, if it was a dried mushroom, maybe they'd be taking a hundred milligrams, uh, maybe 200 milligrams, depending on the person and the size of the person. Whereas if you really want to get the, the full experience, you might be taking two grams. Got it. Um, so there's a definite difference there. And, and, you know, microdosing at a hundred milligrams, you're probably not going to feel anything at all. And, and, you know, people who microdose, they're just going to have to decide what's the, the right amount and have a scale where they can weigh it out to get the right amount. But probably anywhere from a hundred to 250 micrograms would, would be what's considered a microdose. Anything less than hundred milligrams, I would think would be, you know, kind of very minimal and get lost in the shuffle. Got it. Okay. Well, cool. This has been extremely informative. I'm glad that we touched on that a little bit at the end too. Um, like I said before to all the listeners, I am going to link all this stuff in the show notes, but um, before I let you go, can you just give the listeners a place to find you, whether that's social media or your website or, or really any and as many links that you have to provide on this stuff uh, as you'd like? Sure. Well, well, come to our website. It's namex.com, N-A-M-M-E-X.com. I've got a, a, a menu there for educational materials. We've got a lot of, of cool information as well as some slideshows about how we grow our mushrooms and also the differences between these products that I've been telling you about, the, the tempeh-like products and genuine mushroom products. And then we have a, a um, direct-to-consumer side of the business called realmushrooms.com. Uh, go there. Realmushrooms.com has got some great information there too. And, and you know, one of the things that I'm, I, I'm not here trying to sell product to anybody. I just want to educate people. I want people to know more about mushrooms, how they can be beneficial for you either as a food or as a, a um, natural medicine. So um, really come to either of those websites, lots of info there for you. I love it. And I appreciate that because for me, it's, it's really just about giving good information and making sure people 
are not just wasting their money. They're putting their money in the right places to get the right benefits. So um, I'm right there with you, but uh, I really, really appreciate the time. I know we were passing an hour, so I'm gonna let you get going, but thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking uh, all things mushrooms. Uh, thanks, Cody. It's been great to talk to you. I really appreciate it. 